Without commitment, you'll never start. But more importantly, without consistency, you'll never finish. It's not easy. If it was easy, there'd be no Kerry Washington. If it was easy, there'd be no Taraji Henson, P. Henson. <laughs> if it were easy, there'd be no Octavia Spencer. But not only that, if it were easy, there'd be no Viola Davis. If it were easy, there'd be no Michael T. Williamson, no Stephen McKinley Henderson, no Russell Hornsby. If it were easy, there'd be no Denzel Washington. So keep working. Keep striving, never give up, fall down seven times, get up eight. Ease is a greater threat to progress than hardship. Ease is a greater threat to progress than hardship. So keep moving, keep growing, keep learning. See you at work. Yo, 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 yo. Guys, guys, uh, does anyone have a poo 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 with Jack? Do you have a poo 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 after that? My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Find it, find it. Poo poo, okay, I'll see you. One, two, three. Yes! <laughs> Listen to that. Um, Denzel says, ease is a greater threat to progress than hardship. So keep moving, keep growing, keep learning. See you at work. Oh, my goodness. So that got me fired up. Welcome to another episode of Organizational Behavior with Superior Moyo. It's an honor to have my friends in the building. Hello. 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 How are you? <laughs> Very well. Is this weird? Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I normally don't have a microphone yeah. to, to talk to you, but... Yeah. <laughs> this is so nice, guys. So, so we're going to talk about something I've entitled The Impact of Odds Beating on Career Outcomes. So the clip that we've just played is by Denzel Washington. So he was giving a speech after he had won Most Outstanding Actor in a Motion Picture at, I think they are called the NAACP Awards. And that is just inspirational. And that fired me up. But when I was thinking about it later, and I was thinking about when Denzel says, if it was easy, there wouldn't be this or that and that. I started thinking, but why shouldn't it be easy? Maybe I think it should be easy. Why do we keep motivating it, each other to succeed against the odds? Can't we just remove the odds so so i want to chat about about that the impacts the impact of odds beating on career outcomes so it's a special episode i have two brilliant minds in the building who are my friends um so on my left uh Rufilo dinanga is my friend the co-founder and ceo of twice blue an organizational development and learning firm is that is that how you still define twice blue uh, yeah, except we, uh, we add, um, what, learning and organizational development. Okay, yeah. all right, so that's fine. Yeah. She's an experienced entrepreneur. She has built a successful business and I think can provide valuable insights into the challenges faced by entrepreneurs globally. My other friend, uh, who looks so nervous, you know when you like, <laughs> you know when you introduce a guest speaker at a conference, then they have this... <laughs> mm. What is he going to say? <laughs> Anis Sombata is a training manager who has also dabbled into entrepreneurship and with her experience in the workplace as and as an entrepreneur, I think she can also shed light on the odds individuals faced in both the workplace and I think in the entrepreneurial journey. So welcome, my friends. Rifilo, how are you? Oh, man, I'm good, CPWA. Um, yeah, it's... It's, it's been quite a tough 2023. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people can relate. And I think that, you know, post the pandemic, mm -hmm. it's only now that we're seeing the true effects mm -hmm. of um, everything playing out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we we not only survived, but we we thrived. And so I am well. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. Uh, Andy, so if you imagined there were no mics and we were just sitting <laughs> in our conversations where we normally sit and I asked, how are you? What would you say? I'm well. I'm okay. well. Truly blessed. I think uh, the last couple of years have been a huge shift for me. Mm -hmm. um, moving from pure corporate into entrepreneurship has been quite a journey, but it's mm -hmm. been exciting. I think there was a lot of learning, a lot of unlearning. Um, but 
so far so good. I think mm-hmm. I'm very well and just looking forward to the new year. Mm-hmm. Are there any things that you wish you knew before you jumped? <laughs> definitely. Definitely. I think um believing in yourself first because mm-hmm. you come up a lot of of hurdles you come up a lot of challenges and you know you you always having to knock down the doors and i really wish i had knew that even the relationships that i had um were not an automatic entry into some spaces mm. i still needed to do a lot of um relationship building a lot of rapport building um i mean in a formal and informal space mm. but um i think 2023 really helped me because it was like refilo said a very quiet year mm. i think we only now starting to truly come around and say okay well, how do we want the future to be formed so mm-hmm. yeah i really wish i had known that the relationships i had were were valuable but how i needed to hone and get a lot more out of them than i did mm-hmm. all right cool so let's get to know our guest a little bit better so i definitely know you i'll never forget refile i want you to chat to to our listeners about um, and our viewers about your origin story where you come from uh, how do you define yourself but i'll never forget one day we were in santin and we posted a picture of you having a South African delicacy called amaguinya and and in for our international viewers you must always say international viewers <laughs> even if they, you think they are four <laughs> there's a very nice if you come to South Africa please ask for amaguinya it's mostly in the townships uh, of South Africa and we're having amaguinya and then we posted this i think on facebook and then one person said oh she's so humble <laughs> <laughs> so could you could you maybe use this opportunity to tell us about who's Rafila yeah. where do you come from and so yeah, on Yeah well sure I am the first born of three uh, children mm. I was born and raised in Alexandra by my grandparents and my mother mm. um and yeah I, I think I think I had a good childhood mm. you know um it's only looking back now mm. um now that i have better that you realize that actually perhaps i was poor mm. <laughs> mm. but it certainly didn't feel like it mm. um yeah so my mom raised me and she beat a lot of odds um to make sure that i am where i am today mm. Um she she took me to a private school at the time mm-hmm. uh on her weekly checkers wages. Sure. Um and I grew up with my grandparents selling various things from peaches to you name it whatever we could find we sold. Mm-hmm. Um and and yeah so my the basic uh business concepts I think I gathered Um at that time uh, I later on graduated with a BCom mm. in industrial psychology mm. and yeah that's where my passion and interest in the workplace and its complexities began but mm. yeah um me eating magonya is not being humble exactly. it's <laughs> I I make them <laughs> you make them? can you make them I, I can make them <laughs> so so yeah it's it's not me being humble yeah, it's, yeah. it's just me being me yeah. um yeah so so part of my identity is township life yeah. township lingo yeah. and you know all the challenges that are typically faced by someone who comes mm. from an environment like mine yeah and i think some of, sometimes i think those origin stories are really important because because i think represent representation matter i think when someone looks at at you and and the things that you've managed to do yes you still have dreams but when we look at your life we see someone who's achieved and and, it, and i think it does help once in a while to say yo if someone has the similar background that i have then it, it inspires so i think those stories do really encourage us and this one wet i want to say it in king james english where does <laughs> thou come it from i come it from the southwestern touch <laughs> Um so yeah so I'm a Zulu girl born mm. and bred in Soweto though so I'm one of those people that when I say I'm going home yeah, I'm literally driving you. an hour mm. <laughs> and yes we exist um but yes uh, born and bred in Soweto I think I've lived there all my life uh, except for now became an adult and then moved out um went to all township schools all public schools all my life mm. and quite similar to Rafilo's story both my parents um also come from um pretty disadvantaged backgrounds both mm. my parents were laborers all their lives mm. 
my dad did branch out into some sort of small entrepreneurship uh, mm-hmm. towards the later end of his life. Um, and that also taught me a lot about starting small. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, born and raised in Soweto. Then I moved to Pretoria when I started my career. Um, and also the first graduate in my family. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, again, one of the stories of beating the odds. Mm-hmm. I uh, graduated with a BCom, the first qualification that I ever received mm-hmm. in HR, mm-hmm. and I think that's what gave me a passion for young passionate people in the workplace mm-hmm. to say um unless we see people like us, we don't know what it looks like. Mm-hmm. I think we we've ran in similar societies you and I growing up maybe mm-hmm. you before me, but um with some of the most successful people we saw, we didn't even know what they did for a career. Mm-hmm. So we're never exposed mm-hmm. to a lot of these things. Um, so yeah, I'm from Soweto. That is still my home, and yeah, there's no humility in the things we do or the things we eat. It's, my, it's truly my, in do our you guys hearts. feel successful, or is that even a weird question? <sighs> yeah, I think it, it's quite difficult because although you've attained a lot mm. in in our very short lives, I mean, we've we've come across many many hurdles. We've broken down barriers. I mm. think even our parents could not have even imagined um but we're still striving for a lot because i think the more you're exposed to some of these things and some of these spaces something that seemed so far out of reach mm-hmm. for you now becomes attainable mm-hmm. um so although you've you've attained much we are still striving for much but mm-hmm. i don't also want to discount the hard work that has gone into what i've achieved mm-hmm. um because i have beaten some of the odds i have raised the ceiling for some of my other siblings coming behind mm-hmm. me you know some of my cousins they now have someone that they can look up to Mm-hmm. but um no there's still more i think mm-hmm. success is is relative for where we are in in our age and our space i think we're doing i'm doing well for myself mm-hmm. uh but yeah there's still a lot more that i'm dreaming of and mm-hmm. and striving for yeah very interesting spirit i think um you know as you say success is relative that kind of um puts pressure on you know me not having the right to say i don't feel mm-hmm. successful you know mm-hmm. because again it's relative one would look at either material possessions or accomplishments and you know say well you are successful mm-hmm. um but yeah it's it's understanding the fact that um for as long as we breathe we always in pursuit of something else mm-hmm. uh, or something more Um but yeah I, I would say safely say that mm-hmm. I I do feel successful mm-hmm. and also just emphasizing that success is a feeling. Mm-hmm. It's more of a feeling mm-hmm. than it is, you know, the facts of the success mm-hmm. um i.e. your accomplishments or your possessions. Um but yeah I I feel successful. Mm-hmm. I am at peace um but also in pursuit. Mm-hmm. at peace and in pursuit that is going for our short <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, i i i love the fact that you said uh, firstly you don't want to discount what you've done because i think that's very important but also success is a feeling because there are people who are always in pursuit of this elusive feeling of ha eman i'm i've done well and therefore there's there's that constant chasing mm. that mm. that somehow we never even pause to realize what we have and and i think i was saying this at some point and then someone was 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 saying to me no but that 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 discounts the fact that we must continually improve why do you say you are successful but it's a feeling it's a, that satisfaction thing that you feel that i'm content with but the pursuit is still there so i love yeah. that very much yeah. what do you think of the clip that i played oh man so profound so profound but i i really think you know it it reinforces the idea that as human beings um we we do need hardship mm. we do need uh you know progress we do need but ultimately like meaning in mm. our lives right mm. but and we cannot get that meaning if everything was easy sure. i feel like if everything was easily attainable then we sort of cease to exist mm-hmm. um we there's nothing to look forward to mm-hmm. there's nothing to pursue there's there's literally nothing uh, there's no future mm-hmm. without hardships mm-hmm. um so yeah i love i love what denzel um said and how precisely or concisely captured mm-hmm. um you know the thought of you know just having a purpose mm-hmm. and having a meaning um or making meaning out of hardships 
I think you and I have had conversations and are now, I'm now exposing some of the things we say in private. That to to the extent that some sometimes people who have it easy then do not have that resilience and tenacity to go out there and make things happen. You still hold that view? Hmm. Or you've never even held it, I'm, I'm making things up. No, I think, yeah, we, you, you do need to go under the fire. Mm. Um, in, in all of life, there is a process, mm. right? A process that cannot be prayed away mm. or wished away or, you know, um, I, I cannot protest it away. Mm. The process is the process, and sometimes the price is the price for mm. for some of the things that we want. And I think that um, individuals who who struggle with the acceptance of life's re- life's responsibilities tend to have more friction, um, generally in their careers, um, towards their dreams, you know. But it's those that have accepted yeah. and are willing to take the risks, standing shoulders up high mm. um, and facing you know the the injustices of of this world mm. tend to make it um, so yeah I think yeah we we ought to really take responsibility and and not blame anyone for the injustices and the lot that life gives to us mm. absolutely no one is to mm. blame. Mm. But I think once or the alternative is to blame everyone and expect perfect equality, mm. then you are robbing yourself off of the meaning of your life, you know, your purpose. So, so yeah, I, I don't know if that answers that whether answers I, I hold that thought or not. Yeah, I, I think I get it. I think, I think you do. Um, but it links to what I want to ask you, Andy Sobuti. There are, there's sometimes you get a bit of pushback from from younger people. You, I think we're still relatively young, but from younger people <laughs> who are like, can you just stop motivating us and remove the odds? <laughs> Why should we be um, succeeding against all odds? Can uh-huh. just people make sure that you remove the odds, uh-huh. you remove the systematic things yeah. that are holding us back yeah. instead of keep telling us that if it were easy, well, I mean, mm. which sounds nice <laughs> on yeah. the podcast. No, I agree with you. And maybe to just, um, on, on what Rufilo said, that there is adversity. Life on its own has its own adversities. Mm. And if you were not to go through those adversities, you would certainly not grow and progress. Mm. You would be very stagnant in where you are. Mm. But I think what a lot of young people's frustrations, especially in this country, is that those challenges are not inherent to life itself. Mm. These are not seasonalities of life and just going through life. Mm. A lot of these adversities do come about due to some historic past of the country. Mm. A lot of it is institutionalized. A lot of it is systemic. Mm. And there is some validity in what they say. And I think in the last couple of weeks we've seen a lot of uproar in terms of a certain career space that has high high job requirements Mm. when the pay is literally less than the minimum wage Mm. and and you can see that although it makes it seem like the requirements of the job are inherent to what you are producing but the requirements are actually a way to discriminate against a certain group of people Mm. Um, so those types of odds we definitely need to interrogate we definitely need to question and we definitely need to ask and demand even Mm -hmm. redress to say you cannot have um, some of these um, restrictions and and, you know things that are in the job description that make it seem like it's the inherent um, nature of the role Mm -hmm. but really they're just a way to exclude huge populations of South Africa Mm -hmm. Um, and I I think we we need to challenge those things and there is some validity in what a lot of young people are saying because they want to enter into spaces into the spaces sorry but but they they face personal challenges Mm -hmm. from Things like background, race, gender, age, um, you know, access to finances, access to transport. Those are seemingly easy things. But when you're someone who comes from a very impoverished background, um, small hurdles are magnified because of of the the space that you are now in. Something as simple as traveling to work. I mean, in South Africa, if you look at the capital, the economic capital, it's Santon. But if you look at majority of the townships, they are 
a good 30, 40 kilometers mm-hmm. away from Santa. Mm-hmm. That's two taxis, two buses, mm-hmm. 400 rand Uber a day. And those are challenges that definitely need to be removed one way or another, either by creating the infrastructure that removes them or by compensating people equally in order for those to be removed by their financial circumstances. I love this conversation so much already. And and even our producers at the back are not <laughs> And I think, um, I I think, I don't know where this phrase comes from, that it's not an either or, but it's a both end, that that we need to consciously fight against some of these odds. But if you are sitting down and you are alone, you cannot wait for the odds to disappear. Um, while we are fighting, you have to try and navigate, which yeah. I think that personal agency is so important yes. uh, that you don't relax and then say, remove, remove the odds. Yeah. So I want to introduce a bit of science and then we will delve into I'm loving this conversation, guys. I don't want to lie. So <laughs> it turns out there are people who study this area of odds beating and its relationship with career outcomes. In other words, um, they try to find whether this idea of odds beating, which refers to individuals who have achieved professional success despite uh, facing those unfavorable odds or challenge, challenging circumstances. So they try and find out whether well, if you've had odds against you, you tend to succeed better or you don't. So you are, we want to chat about that. I think there was a study done by Zhang Shen and Peterson which investigated the impact of odds beating on career success. They found that successful individuals, despite these unfavorable odds, experienced more career satisfaction, higher job performance, and increased uh, promotability. I'm very interested to find out what you think of that study. If I've faced some odds, when I succeed, I feel more satisfied, I perform better, and I have a better chance of being promoted. Does it resonate even though you know there was empirical evidence in what you've seen does that resonate yeah definitely um i guess it goes back to you know what is your purpose and your meaning um in life Mm. and i guess if you look at the majority of the the most successful people they've um you know wanted to go and achieve something greater than themselves Mm. you know or they wanted to solve a problem big enough globally. Mm. Um, and sure, there's going to be some hardships. It, it definitely won't be easy. There's uh, some barriers to that. Um, but because they committed mm. to doing it and seeing it through, they get the reward, which is the meaning and the satisfaction that comes from all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, definitely, I think that is precisely what I have seen. Mm-hmm. And I think that if we, if we can try and make things easier, but I think it's also, we also need to teach people um, to be able to accept, mm-hmm. um, you know, the various injustices in the world Mm -hmm. um, and the odds that are up against us and some things are a you know a a function of time Mm -hmm. as well we are living uh, post apartheid you know so we we cannot expect all of those inequalities to disappear overnight Mm -hmm. but as you say we also cannot wait to have the right odds so that we can do something Mm -hmm. so literally what we then need to do is accept the challenge, take on the responsibility and show up, you know. Accept the challenge, uh, take on the responsibility and show up. Can I make it a little bit personal? So Mm. most of the people who learn about inequality in South Africa um, often often are shown this picture of the contrast between Alexander and Santin. And, And Alexander is... A few kilometers from Santin, that's where you grew up. And for many, many years now, we've shared an office in, uh, the thing they call the richest square mile in, yeah. in Africa, yes. in Santin. Yes. To someone else, how do you even, uh, people who can't even comprehend how do you make it over that bridge? How did you do that? Oh gosh, that is, sure. Sure. Yeah, I think to, to a certain it? yeah to a certain level, um, I had to be naive. Mm. I had to stop counting the odds. Mm. 
Well, if odds are probability, you know, if I'm going, well, the odds are against me here, they're against me there, and I dare not try, mm. I I wouldn't have been in the richest square mile mm. um, in Africa. But, yeah, I, I dared to believe. Mm. Um, and as Andis was saying, to believe in myself. Mm. And I think that's a bigger... Um, task or challenge is to actually believe in yourself. I'm not talking about confidence. Mm. Um, I'm not talking about arrogance, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about, you know, believe in yourself and be willing to bet on yourself. Mm. Um, the majority of the things that I've uh, accomplished and achieved are due to my intentionality to build my character. Mm. Um, and understand that my worldview while sitting in Alexandra is not it. Sure. I had to be exposed to more. I had to learn more. Um, I had to be more. And I had to dare. Mm. I had to dare. I remember as few when we first opened Twice Blue and we were having, or well, I was having uh, an interview with the late Karima Brown. Mm. Um, I can't remember what the conversation was about, but it was about... Um, young entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. you know, and the challenges that we face. Um, and then we were asked to introduce ourselves. So um, I did, and it was a panel of young entrepreneurs. And I remember a, a caller calling in and saying, at the time, I think I was 23, 24, mm -hmm. um, and a caller saying, what gives Refilo a right mm -hmm. to give corporate advice mm -hmm on anything. Mm. I think I walked away from that interview, you know, a bit despondent, okay. a bit, you know, shattered. Mm. Because for me, it meant that I needed to have the credibility to do, to do something, mm. right? Mm. And at that point, I probably didn't have, you know, as much credibility as I do now. Mm. Um, but it, it, it just exposed me to, you know, a prevalent mind, mindset mm. is that we get caught up in a loop to say, or putting precursors of what we need. Sure. You know, I need to be credible um, to, to build the next McKinsey or Ernest & Young. Um, but at the same time, what am I supposed to wait for the credibility? Mm -hmm. I have to start somewhere. Sure. Um, so I think that exposed sure. to me that a lot of people are sitting and having that kind of self-talk with mm. themselves um, and will never beat the odds, you know. So you've, you've got yeah. to dare, um, despite the odds being against you, you've got to dare to start. You've got to dare, um, you know, to, to solve a problem uh, big enough and bigger than yourself. Mm you know, and commit to it and see through. So hence why I say there are injustices in the world. There are odds packed up against mm -hmm. you, but you you ought to accept them and show up. So you say you're about 23, 24 now, um, and you've, you, you stuck to it and you are here. Yeah, yeah. And, and now the credibility is is there yeah you know when we interview um entrepreneurs who've stayed with the game now you show up and you are in those panels at i think you were at leader x yeah which is one of the platforms for credible incredible leaders in in the country well done thank you thank for, you for sharing thank you thank for you. sharing for and so for you so it is the, probably the most famous um, yeah. township uh, that people know about around the world. How did you navigate? Um, so if if someone says, "Okay, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about the how-to," how to, what did you do? What is the kind of mindset you had to have? And then we will chat about what some researchers are saying. Yeah. 
So yeah, unfortunately, unlike Alex, yeah. <laughs> we don't have proximity. <laughs> yeah. You know, exactly. we don't have physical proximity to True. see some of these things. Because I think also seeing it makes you believe mm. that man, like there is something bigger. Mm. But one thing I am very grateful for is that I went to some of the best best schools mm. in Soweto. Mm. We had some of the most passionate teachers. That best I've, schools in the, Soweto. Which one is we that? We are the <laughs> Secondary School. Okay. Promise you, for like for like five years right we were it's in so the top cool, yeah. five performing schools in Soweto. Wow. They were so passionate. Those teachers went over and above. Okay. And one thing that they gave us was exposure, mm. right? Because we don't have the proximity to see some of these things. Mm. We don't have to, the opportunity to see the most successful people. And even when we do, they are often coming in and going out. Mm. So you don't actually get to see their lives and, and how they came about to achieve what they achieved. But what these teachers sure. did was give us a vision or a template that there is more than what you see here. Mm. You can strive for more, you can dream for more, and mm. you can want more for yourselves. I think they gave us so many opportunities. Mm. I think at some point we were even taking French lessons. I was like, why? Really? <laughs> wow. I was like, why? But in their minds, they're like, a little, bit? Uh, a little bit. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm able to say hello and how are you? We often have like a bit of banter with, yeah, with, uh, with Phyllis' husband. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so but there were passionate teachers who really had a passion for children, a passion for education, but a passion for us succeeding. Mm. And I remember even when I went to university to register for my first qualification, I didn't know what I wanted to be. Mm. There was no guidance. There was no, um, you know, like a broader understanding of what it actually means to build a mm. career. You just get the prospectus from the various universities and you're like, which subject am I good at? Mm. You go to that and you're like, oops, I'm going to be an economist. Mm. And I, re I remember <laughs> applying for economics and econometrics. <laughs> and I get to the university the first week and they're like, oh no, it's full. And I was like, okay, which other course is empty? It's available. <laughs> and actually, they're like, that, that age house course is open i was like sign me up because <laughs> i knew that i didn't want what i see i wanted something that i saw on tv something huh. that huh. i could not touch that i could not feel that i had no access to but if other people had that life i could also have that life and i always remember telling myself that the people who live these lives they're, they're not extraterrestrial they're not semi-gods they're not they are humans just like me and if they can achieve it, so can I. And and I think having that seed planted in your head that you can from a young age, having parents who affirm you that you are smart, that you can do it, that you know when you are reading books and you're not watching TV or playing outside, that there's nothing wrong with you. Mm. There's also nothing wrong with playing outside, but that you can dream for more and that you can strive for more. And, and we came up very very tough challenges because even adversity and I only realize this when I'm in the workplace that there's a lot of social capital that you build up as you grow mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. from going to these private schools from <clears> going <throat> to these sports things that people do and said we never had any of that so even when you come into the corporate space you don't know how to network and navigate those spaces mm -hmm. properly so there definitely were a lot of challenges but I think it's that internal compass that you have that says I want more for myself and I can achieve more for myself mm. if someone else can do it i certainly can do it and mm. because i know i'm smarter mm. i can probably do it better mm. <laughs> and i think when you sit in a lot of these circles you're like i can do this <laughs> yeah it should be. yeah you're like no i can i can do this like i know i'm competent enough to do this i'm yeah. competent enough to understand some of these things but but soweto is 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 also quite good with cultivating um resilience mm. Um, cause I remember walking 10, 12 kilometers to school mm -hmm. and a lot of South Africans can, can attest to that, mm -hmm. that that is their daily reality. Mm -hmm. But I, I remember this is not my life. Mm -hmm. This is not my life. I know I want better for myself. I can do better sure. for myself. I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. Um, on so many levels. I, I also had to walk to this private school. Sure. Um, and you know, across that famous project. across <laughs> that <laughs> um, but yeah I, I, I can totally relate in that I think internally we all have that that voice that says mm, this mm. is not it mm, you know this is not it, this is not it. I, I don't belong here mm. but also I might not yet belong there mm. and so you find yourself in this um, tricky middle mm. Um, and, and as I say, that tricky middle is the opportunity for you 
to then build character yeah. mm. and you carve know. your own path uh, to yeah. really carve your own path yeah so yeah i think sure yeah ne, hey, you are really taking us back, back. back. <laughs> you know why we always we always laugh with the, with the, the team about this because it's the people who are who have would never call themselves motivational what what who motivate us here yo you guys are provoking me hard <laughs> and and i'm starting to imagine we are talking about a physical bridge that you had to to overcome and mm. and go over then i'm i'm imagining that as a metaphor as well that when you were there and you used those words mm. that you i don't want what i see here and 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 it's it's interesting because when 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 you don't see that in some of the people who might be in the situations you were in mm-hmm. how do you try and and provoke somebody to say to you, and there is more they mm-hmm. um, because not everyone sees it i'm trying to find out what makes you see that what you see now is not it yeah. there is more yeah. i guess the exposure part the exposure and, part i think people around you i think i think definitely there are people who will awaken mm-hmm. a different in you you know mm-hmm. some people who will show you whether it's someone who comes to your school and just does a talk whether it's go scrolling through youtube and finding this video mm. w- whatever the medium is i do believe that those people are sent mm. to show you that you can strive for more mm. um and uh, for me growing up i used to watch a lot of tv i was a huge opera fan mm. <laughs> and just mm-hmm. like knowing about her story and just seeing how she had progressed through life i mean maybe we can have a different conversation mm. now mm. but just knowing that this is someone who came from those type of odds mm. with everything stacked up against her and at some point those things were meant to topple her mm. like they were they were coming for her mm. um but she still stood um seeing those types of stories seeing the people that she would always interview um South African talk shows South African magazines um and 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 there would always be people who come to the township schools mm. you know to <laughs> to come mm. motivate us and although they would come and go and you don't have a physical model of what mm-hmm. it looks like cuz sometimes it's also good to see how someone lives mm-hmm. and how they navigate and how they make decisions cuz that's how it informs your own decision making and your mm-hmm. own resilience right um but i i do think that they come mm-hmm. they come and that's why platforms like this are so important that's why conversations like this should never stop mm-hmm. particularly for the children that are still in those situations that we haven't made it but mm-hmm. fully let me say we haven't made it fully mm. but we 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 certainly have beat a lot of the odds that were stacked against us from the time that we were born ah! now this thing is hot all right so <laughs> let me move it uh, so the people who study this odds beating stuff they they also talk about a concept called cumulative disadvantage um that suggests that individuals from those disadvantage backgrounds unfortunately then face a series of compounding obstacles through mm-hmm. their lives which then hinder their ability to overcome the adversity so we've spoken now about the ability to just see through uh, that you can overcome but once it starts being cumulative then mm-hmm. these compounding obstacles are just harder and harder and 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 some of them are rooted in issues like status race gender disability and and, and so on what what then do you do when when it just looks like just like compounding interest these obstacles are just mm-hmm. getting more and more and more which i think is what is happening in south africa right now mm-hmm. um unfortunately our economy is getting worse and therefore if you have not um entered the workplace the odds of you getting into a place sure. then mm-hmm. shrink and mm-hmm. shrink and shrink What do you think about that? Yeah, and unfortunately it is a very true phenom- phenomenon especially in South Africa. Mm. Um given our background. So a, a typical example would be a child that grows up in a rural area. At least we were a, a little bit advantaged to mm. still be in a township and urban area where we still had some access to things. But if you consider that a large population of South Africans do live in rural areas. So mm. if you take that this distance, right? So if someone were to come to study in one of the metropolitan cities, that's accommodation that they have to cater for. Mm. 
probabilities that their parents work very middle income jobs they probably can't even afford the tuition at the school let alone the accommodation mm. the sustenance that comes with that so there's a, already a financial burden mm. and when they get to these schools they still have to compete you know mm. you you compete academically but you also compete socially right because mm. there's mm. other perks that come with it yeah. there's clubs that you need to belong to there's relationships that you need to build outside of the academics um so already that's another challenge you're already out because of that you don't live in the right place you don't come from the right place therefore you don't have access to some of these spaces and conversations then let's say you graduate and you enter the workforce you you still need to <laughs> find accommodation that means that we, as opposed to your counterparts where your set their salaries are going into either advancing their studies building up investments and savings and things like that your salary is going towards sustenance because mm-hmm. you need to survive in the city that's accommodation that's transportation mm-hmm. just just surviving therefore you find yourself in even a deeper pool mm. therefore advancements become very difficult i remember when i bought my first vehicle I, mm. i didn't buy it because i was like oh i'm working now i need a vehicle it was because my first day of my permanent job the bus had left me three yeah. times in the morning <laughs> <laughs> it had left me three times in the morning not because i was late but the bus had come full so from oh, previous no stops the bus was already full. Sure. So I remember on day 3 and it was a Wednesday. I remember saying no 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 this is a bad rip, mm. right? So I, I had I had to buy a car. Mm. And the car also gives you access to things like, you know, after work yes. social activities. Mm. That's where you build a lot of networks, you build mm. a lot of relationships. Um and and if if that that's where your entire salary is going that means you are not engaged in any postgraduate mm. studies sure. you are, you are not in you are not traveling and exploring mm. like your 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 other mm. peers you're not so, saving you're not saving not in, you're not reinvesting, reinvesting in yourself you know so so mm. it, it almost seems like you are already starting at a minus 10 mm. and even moving from a minus 10 to a zero is a huge step mm. um but again it, you need to remember your why and your resilience to say even when you make these decisions and they, and they seem like they are uh cumulative disadvantages mm-hmm. you have to take the positive out of it to say okay now that i have made this decision that seems like it's two steps back mm-hmm. how do i now work to get me to four steps ahead mm-hmm. so now that i have a car i need to engage in postgraduate studies how mm-hmm. do i do that you seek out um bursaries you seek out funding from your employers you still have the agency mm-hmm. to change the course of your life um cuz life is not given to us sometimes you you really have to take mm. it and it it's hard it's tough it's challenging but it it can be done and even when you do make those decisions to move the disadvantage to the advantage you are still in control of that decision mm. you need to be fully conscious of what you're doing mm. but it is very true that once you start um progressing from disadvantage to advantage it is a cumulative and compounding factor that mm. the odds just stack up against you mm. but again it's not undoable you 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 can do it you mm. you definitely can um prosper even mm. in seemingly the worst odds mm. you, yeah. have, you have a comment Yeah I'm just reflect as she's uh talking I'm mm. reflecting on my own journey mm. and that's that that's definitely true um but also the fact that I you know you've got to get to a place also where you where you decide um on some of the decisions that you make mm. that do you want the emotions of it or do you want the progress mm. you know mm. and I think most of us when we bought our first um vehicle we thought that oh this is it mm. you know i'm in you know only to discover that oh well mm. not quite <laughs> you know not quite and um i certainly had to undo some of the decisions that i made just to you know get my foot in mm. um that perhaps maybe buying a a i20 is a wiser decision mm. than buying a Range Rover because mm. now you have the salary and I think yeah, there that, is a that little that doesn't sound hypothetical to me <laughs> <laughs> it's an example well he's, 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 la- he's laughing because it's I had exam. a Range Rover <laughs> <laughs> and he is <laughs> you know but yeah i think um it just has a lot to do with the quality of decisions mm-hmm. that we need to make now that you have survived and now that you are in you've mm-hmm. beat you've beaten these odds but there's also a consequence to you know those yeah. decisions that you've yeah. made to beat 
mm. the odds mm. and sometimes those decisions also leave you either financially exposed or mm. ne- not necessarily making the best mm. um, decisions that will yield the best outcomes mm. um, for you mm. um, and so I think there's just a, a pit a pitfall mm. that you know instead of um investing in not even investing but mm. buying a car mm. i could have been starting a business that mm. would you know make sure that i am financially mm. secure um but yeah i think there's a lot to be said about yes beating the odds but as well as you know delaying gratification uh-huh. because when the odds are cumulatively stacked up against you there is a sense of when i make it mm-hmm. yeah. i i really want to sure, be yeah. you know mm-hmm. in there um mm-hmm. and so delaying gratification i think is one of the things that i yeah. I, i i i had to practice mm-hmm. um as part of my character building to say well what is my why and where am i going mm-hmm. um what do i want to build mm-hmm. and because it's greater than me mm-hmm. Um, then you make your decisions uh, differently. Mm. I think maybe to add on what you're saying, it might have been heightened. You see that feeling? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It might have been heightened with social media because mm. social media sort of magnifies mm. everything and it almost seems like everyone is making it except you. Mm. And and I remember having this conversation previously to say we know a lot of successful people even in our ranks mm. and they're not living half of the lives that we see on social mm. media. That is probably the 0.001%. And I'm not saying people are living lies, but I'm just saying yeah. that is that is super magnified. And that's a small percentage of the population. Um, and, and I think a lot of young people might fall into the trap of making those bad decisions um, because they are trying to keep up with the person on the screen. Absolutely. Um, but but in, in, in fact delaying your gratification is probably the best thing that you mm-hmm. can do as a as a young person even mm-hmm. when you have those accumulative disadvantages you know mm-hmm. when other people are are getting cars maybe it's wiser for you not to get a car mm-hmm. you know maybe it's wiser for you to continue investing mm-hmm. when other people are doing international trips maybe it's just a little bit wiser for you mm-hmm. to um you know go to durban <laughs> you know go to durban <laughs> and if you can use the train <laughs> like oh, but yes, I, the train is back the train is back but yeah. this was an actual conversation that we were having that It, it almost seems like because of social media yes. everyone else is making it and you no, are not that's, and that's not and true that's not true we 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 are in one of again the richest square mile mm. and people although people are living very good lives mm. it's nowhere near what we see mm-hmm. on social media and i i really hope young people have the discernment yeah. and the wisdom to make the right decisions that say i will work for my future as opposed to working for my now and my gratification and satisfaction for today. Yeah. Absolutely. Um so this is this is what I'm curious about. Um so one of the odds we speak about is is that when you grow up in a disadvantaged uh, background, one of the odds that are against you is that you don't have the right relationships. And and there's a lot of pushback with uh people who say Spiro please stop telling us that we can make it. and introduce us to your people <laughs> <laughs> introduce us to your networks because mm-hmm. i think people mm-hmm. have figured out that there is a power in relationships and and i remember giving him carry saying this on radio that but people must also remember that many of us were not born with those relationships yes. mm-hmm. and i think we're sitting in this table you were not born with these relationships but you've managed to cultivate them yeah uh, and 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 you I feel like you even have a whatsapp group with ceos and so on. how does that work how do i then say okay i wasn't born with these relationships but i'm not going to sit and say oh well i'm going to try and cultivate these relationships how do you guys do how did you guys do it how do you do it uh, yeah. and and which obviously has helped in in these career hmm. outcomes we're talking about hmm. Here's the thing I think that most people miss is that to build a network you've got to add value. Mm, you've yeah. got to be valuable yourself. Mm. So I think before you demand an introduction, you've got to ask yourself, well then what is it that I'm adding to this network? Mm. What is it that's of value to other people that I can offer them? Mm. Um and so you start to build your working capital around that and you start to build your value mm. you know around that then 
you know which relationships it is that you need that would then advance you but it's a give and take mm. um simply put um i cannot be part of a network but i don't add value. any value mm. which i think is the the tricky part mm. is what is it um that is unique to me that i can offer other people mm. um and i think that's part of the character building and that's part of you know um maybe building a brand mm. around yourself um whether it, it's an online brand mm. or it's just a brand mm. or a good name mm. um for yourself so i've had to build a good name for myself mm. i've had to intain- be intentional about some relationships mm. i had to invest the time i also had to invest some resources to mm. some relationships um and also just understanding that you know as much as they are of value to me i might not be of value to them now mm-hmm. um and also just you know making peace with that mm-hmm. you know but i think the more you build your uh, working cap- capital and i think it's call newport who says be so good that they cannot ignore you mm-hmm. you know so instead of focusing on ah introduce me mm-hmm. you know connect me mm. maybe perhaps focus on you know what 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 do i have to offer mm. what problems can i solve for people mm. um that makes me valuable what mm. knowledge do i have that if i share it be valuable to other people mm. so yeah i think that perspective needs to be adjusted a bit mm. um and no one should feel entitled to another's network because mm. We worked hard. Mm-hmm. We work hard. You work hard to be in the rooms that you are in. Mm-hmm. Um and yeah, I think I think that view needs to be adjusted a bit. So they should suffer too to get into this room. Um I wouldn't mm-hmm. say building value and a work ethic and discipline and character was a suffering. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want to look at it no, it's, yeah. in in that way. Okay, right? I get so you. But but yeah, occasionally I need an intro too. Mm. Um but it has to be in such a way that if I ask you to introduce me to someone's peer, mm. I I need to know that you know that I'm good for it. Mm. You know. Mm. And that you know that I will add value sure. to ever you would confidently introduce me to. So there's a lot of that's the difference. You know, yeah, that's yeah. the difference that you need to introspect in that way. It's say like we can't just be entitled that mm. well as pure you black you mm. in these circles on fire. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Put me in. <laughs> yeah. But but if I ever say that to you as pure, you know, it's it probably something that you would confidently do. Mm. I guess. No, But that's yeah. true. That's yeah. very very true and you're making me think about What do I really think about when someone says can you please introduce me to so and so what are those uh, things that are at the back of my mind that then makes me but you've just nailed it it's it's about do I think that the relationship that I I have with that person is safe by me introducing yeah. that that other person to the add value and is a, is also integrity and so on and so forth which is really huh. cool <clears throat> I mean to think about it if I'm If I'm coming across as entitled to you and mm. I say introduce me and if you do introduce me what am I you know mm. I'll also be entitled there mm. um and also because you've built a good name for yourself so mm. wherever you introduce me mm. I in a way am you know carrying your name mm. um and so that's one of the things that you sure. know I've I've done to get the business uh where it is today mm. is yes i've i've partnered with people i've shown my worth mm. you know i've i've worked hard so that i don't even have to ask them to introduce me mm. they are offering me as value to someone else you know say i think you should speak to refilwe because i i think this is her this she, she will solve that for you um versus me you know saying please introduce me mm. um so then you get that word of mouth referral mm. Mm. but yeah it, it in turn builds a good name for you so i think focusing on the value that you're adding 
is a, a better way or better strategy. Before we go to Andy, so to hear you, I, I remember there's a, there's a there's something I usually say, and people think it's cheesy because we motivational speakers say cheesy <laughs> things. I, there's something that I say that a time is coming where um, no one can speak about your industry without mentioning your name. And it is true. The, you you work so hard. I and and eventually your name is so close with in people's mouths they just talk about you all the time. Yeah. And that's how it works. Do you have a view on these network things before I nudge us to a different topic? Yeah, no, I think I'll be short. But you you're right. Um your social capital is actually quite uh, an important thing especially when you are on the entrepreneurial space mm, but mm. let me also just take it away from the entrepreneurial space into the uh, corporate or commercial mm. space mm. that sometimes a person's reputation when someone says you know put my name in the basket mm. it's 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 quite risky right because every time you make a decision because the work often the work that we do is not tangible we are mm. not producing a product you know with the product it's easy to quality assure it and see defects and that's it but when you're introducing a service or a person um, there's lots of subjectivity there. So mm. if, if I were to bring in a supplier or, you know, someone who is going to help us with the service, um, there's always the question of who bought this person yeah. here? <laughs> and I'm often the one that they're looking at to say, and then where did you get this yes. one, you know? Yeah. But but again, you need to have the value add. Sure. In order for, for you, you can come to me and say, no, you know, I'm good at one, two, three, four. Can you please like consider me? Mm you need to already have had an impact you need to have a portfolio you need to have a reputation of your own um because often enough we are not willing to take the risk even as people internally mm. because that's our name that's our reputation so if oh. i put you in and you do a terrible job then definitely there's more scrutiny when i have to do something else right and mm. i don't want that on myself mm. so um the social capital is very important but you also need to have a reputation around your work you also need to have value add that you have already cultivated on your own mm. and by the time i recommend you it's a unanimous yes mm. even when people do want to say mm, maybe not they can't even grasp at something that you probably are not doing right mm. um because you've gotten every single thing that we have asked for and you've delivered sure. on every single point. So I think that's very important in the space that we're in, that we are delivering. We are literally selling um, a service. We are selling mm. a value add. We're selling an offering. We're not selling a product. Mm. And and that opens us up to so much more criticism as opposed to if we were selling, you know, a table, no, a wheel or an alto or a bot. Mm. Yeah. There's really no doubt that there's a reputation you cultivate in corporate as well, yeah. where people then start calling you. The way, you know when you no longer go to interviews, very coffee. Yeah. Yes, let's, <laughs> do let's, let's, let's do coffees. Let's do coffees and see if there's a feed. <laughs> And it's are, you, are you interested? Are you? Oh, we check whether <laughs> yeah. you are interested. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay, Rafila, I want to talk to you about Twice Blue. Okay. Um, what does Twice Blue do? And um, when you think about your journey in the last few years, what are some of the odds you've faced? Where are you in terms of business right now? Sure. Um, just a bit of a reflection question. Can I reflect on the mic? Sure. <laughs> okay, so firstly, um, Twice Blue is a learning and organizational development company. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that corporates um, engage with us um, with regards to their people management and people development strategies. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes as far as also executing on those strategies, which takes a form of either uh, training, workshops, or you know, organizational interventions um, that we design for, mm. or custom um, custom designed solutions um, mm. that we do. Um, yeah, I also own other businesses now, and yeah. that's where I'm in. Do tell. Yeah, well, I wanted to diversify a little bit, mm. so yeah, I, I won't tell what it is oh, okay. because I'm yeah just working on those. Okay. But yeah, f um, f gain traction in other industries very mm. different from uh, what it is that I'm doing because mm. I think primarily my my talent my skill is just being a businesswoman that's true so put me in any business I think I would um, yeah really that's try and true. make a success of it um, so so yeah it, the odds that I've had to face PUA are many um, some of them yes cumulative mm. um, I do believe that there were some challenges 
um, for me to gain the credibility that I have. Mm-hmm. It's mostly, um, it is a white dominated space. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a male space. Mm-hmm. Uh, so being young at the time when I when I started mm-hmm. Twice Blue um, and having a voice or having a say on anything just seemed as though I was, you know, punching above my weight. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I, I took it upon myself to learn mm-hmm. um, and yeah, be up there with the best, I guess. Um, so yeah, I, we must Twice never, Blue. <laughs> oh, so we must never underestimate that uh, that ability to... I think beating the odds sounds very soft, but yeah. when you have that cumulative disadvantage, yeah. um, that there is even that rank in privilege, yeah. that you, as a young black female, you're, it's, you, you're fighting harder than I have to fight yeah. uh, because there is that thing in the world. There is, but um, to my advantage, I've kind of been bold and naive mm. I've, I've closed my ears and sometimes ignored the, the probabilities and the stats nice. mm. just to give me a standing chance to even try mm. um, and I think yeah again I say we, we really need to put ourselves in that um, in that position to say mm. that yeah I am aware of the injustices in the world but again I take responsibility and I stand um, so, so yeah where I'm at now we are in a good place um, sure owning a business will really grow you um, and also challenges you because um, one of the most fascinating things about a business's growth is it really really depends on the founders um, and their mindset um, and how they overcome that um, sure there's a lot. Um, it, it actually puts you in a space where you, e- you either battle with yourself mm-hmm. and you know what? It really shows in your business's progress, in the way you do things, mm-hmm. um, in the kind of clients that you have. Mm-hmm. So everything that you do as an entrepreneur um, in your personal space reflects onto the business. So I think it has really taught me to um, be very resilient. Mm-hmm. It has taught me um, to nourish and take care of the relationships that I have. Mm. It has taught me to remove the self-doubt um, that mm. I had. I mean, coming from Alex, you you do wonder if, hmm, am I in the right space? Mm. Or nya papa, mm. or, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah, we, we're in a good space. Um, we are growing. Um, sure. But yeah, also navigating loss in mm. the business mm. as well. So I did not start Twice Blue by myself, mm. uh, by the way. I had mm. two incredible uh, business partners um, and then losing one to COVID mm. was such a huge blow. Mm. Um, apart from, you know, the, the overall effects of the pandemic, it's now dealing with uh, loss mm. um, and re-strategizing to see, you know, what is it that... I can offer mm. or like pivoting the business in various ways mm. um, just to make sure that it, it is sustainable and it is relevant to the changing world of work. Yeah. So good. Um, thank you very much. Quick one. Hmm? What's your view on founders who associate their celebrity founder brand to the business that to the point that it always seems like the founder is as famous as the business. And on the other hand, there are people who are like, hey, please take me out of this thing. Let the business be the business. We have a lot of celebrity founders, I think mainly in the US and also in South Africa, mm-hmm. where if I mess up <coughs> as the founder, you can tell the business is going. So is your question linked to what is the relationship between the founders fame and brand yes. to the success of a business. Yes, and whether it is advisable yeah. to to leverage your own personal brand in the business. Oh, definitely. Mm. Definitely. Um, but I think 
the the mistake that maybe most celebrity founders make is to start a business because they can mm, mm. you know and forgetting that a business is started primarily to to solve a big enough problem that people are willing to pay you for uh-huh. Right. Mm-hmm. So yes, it might be famous, it might gain traction, but if it's not solving a real problem, it's not scalable. It just does not pass the you know the true business test, I guess. Mm. So whether you're Rihanna, you whether you're Rihanna, you, you still have to have a sound business idea, mm. right? Um, and I think maybe because they are famous, maybe they lack. <laughs> some sound advice mm. or I don't know people mm. to 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 advise them that is this a sound business idea or not or are people just validating their ideas mm. instead of you know um, validating the problems that that business is supposed to be solving mm. um, Makes so sense. yeah I don't think there is a major correlation between okay. fame and apart from the fact that it gives you momentum mm. and as twice blue we employed a similar strategy where i did partner with you know um uh, famous mm. to an extent um speakers mm. who got us in rooms where traditionally if i was on my own and no one knows who i am mm. um i wouldn't have gotten those opportunities mm. or maybe to that extent so so yeah build okay. your brand leverage where you need to leverage but have a sound business idea have a sound mm. business model i want to check the, okay so the team says we have to say something in four minutes and cut it <laughs> <laughs> and so if you if you reflect um you've dabbled in in business and and corporate i think you're a hybrid nyana somewhere <laughs> I've, I, i always want to throw in that word what are some of the odds you've you've seen both in your own personal life mm-hmm. but also maybe in corporate and business yeah. and if you have any advice for those odds beating that would be cool yeah i think in corporate a lot of the times because uh, i am in a very white old male dominated industry mm-hmm. um and relatively also very young when i joined mm-hmm. um that a lot of the barriers that i faced were really um I wouldn't say unconscious bias but there definitely was like a lot of microaggression mm. but just understanding who you are understanding your why and being rooted up in that mm. really helps you having a very strong internal sense of self mm. and building your own resilience but one thing that I've always told myself is that I needed to be so competent in my job that no one can take away anything from me mm. that no one if i sit at any table sure. no one can ever accuse me of being a scorecard mm. that i am so good at my job that even if you wanted me out of the door you can't because you will miss the value add that i bring mm. um and and that's how you you, you navigate those types of spaces mm. make yourself so credible that you cannot be shaken mm. and i think that also helps in your entrepreneurial journey because it increases your confidence in what you're able to do but just having a teachable spirit mm. um in increasing your 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 mentor seeking out mentor seeking out um coaches mm. um and also you know requesting for feedback but sound feedback also don't don't go around asking strange people um what they think of you <laughs> um but like you know getting sound <laughs> advice um mm. so that you can also get feedback on where to improve you know how to partner better with the businesses that you serve from an entrepreneurial space mm. and also how to better manage your stakeholders from a corporate space um but yeah just continue you um developing yourself making sure that you are the most competent person in your field mm. um at that point in time that even when you sit at the table that you are unshaken you mm. you know what you bring to the table you know your value add you know what problems you sol- you solving and you know the impact that you are making sure otherwise every small thing is going to topple you mm. um because you even though imposter syndrome is there you always have to remind yourself that i have this track record i've achieved mm. one, two, three, four. Mm. i'm still that person i'm the one that has all the qualification i'm mm. the one that is the industry expert and i'm the one that is able to solve this problem most competently so, so um yeah building yourself up building those relationships seeking feedback but also making an impact and adding value to mm. either your stakeholders internally or to your customer from an entrepreneurial po- mm. point of view Okay so although we're running out of time I'm still committed to ask the few questions that I still have because maybe I won't have you guys back for another 6 months or so hint hint you must come back um so I want to ask this question but 
if you imagine answering them in like a tweet, okay. yeah, those those <laughs> oh, things like that fire we, shots. Yeah, fire <laughs> shots. Let's see if we can do this. Okay, so a study by Stowe and Hoeng um, examined the impact of initial career success on subsequent career trajectories, right? So they find they found, which is interesting for me, that individuals who experienced early success were more likely to continue achieving success throughout their career. And for me, I don't know if I'm the one who's wrong in Akrimuni, but I've always <laughs> thought if you succeed too quickly, too early, it may cause you to undermine what it really, really takes um, to do it. What do you think about the role of early success for you to have those quick wins in, I guess, motivating you to, to, to keep going? You know what, I think um, the study holds true. Mm. Um, I think, was it was it uh, Adam Grant mm-hmm. in his, I think, the new book, Hidden Potential. Mm-hmm. And basically there's a study with chickens. Mm. Um, and so, you know, there's a hierarchy um, in terms of the, the pecking order or the, you know, how uh, chickens feed in a farm. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, the tougher, more healthy looking um, chickens tend to feed first, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, and the ones that look very sick and, you know, their feathers withered off, mm. tend to feed last. There's something to that, you know, mm. it's, it's a momentum thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it was also found that it, it's it's also a brain chemical thing. Mm. You know, the more you win, the more serotonin you have, yeah. the more you want to yeah. keep going and mm. hence you do, right? Mm. Um, so, so, yeah, that, that study is, is true. And I don't think that it's at your detriment mm. to... Um, to succeed early. Mm. It, as a matter of fact, I feel that you need to get those quick and quick small and wins small. Mm. so that you prime and condition yourself, say I am a winner mm. and have that mindset um, and approach and that stature towards anything else that you face. Yeah, Makes sense. Um, probably this is also your bread and butter if you let twice blue. How can then organizations and leaders play a role in, in trying to remove as many odds as possible. What are some of the obvious odds, man, that we should be removing as quickly as possible in organizations to unleash people's uh, potential? Andy, so you can uh, give a view on this as well. I think firstly being intentional Mm -hmm. and having the right attitude towards it. I see a lot of leaders, um, you know, engaging in diversity, equality and inclusion campaigns just for the paper, Mm -hmm. just for the paper trail. But you really need to have a heart for for people and a heart for inclusion in your company. I mean, we've seen that a company that is inclusive and diverse really thrives over and above because it's able to cater to many more consumers than a mainstream mm-hmm. um, organization. But really being intentional about your goals um, and, and you know, having it in your strategy also helps. Mm-hmm. Um, having the right people, trusting the leadership that you have in your company and hiring for the future. Um, I think I see that a lot in the space mm. that I am because it is quite also male dominated mm. that a lot of times that they are hiring for the need today and they're not thinking about how to cultivate mm. for the future and that's yeah. where we are finding people that are way post retirement coming mm. in and you're like, no oh, guys <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, let the people mm. retire. But yeah, I think being intentional um, about what you're doing and 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 not necessarily having those systemic and institution, institutionalized um, barriers, removing them, making sure that you, you are not adding those discriminatory factors as part of the job mm. requirements. Mm. But being transparent, being honest, you know, having fair and open conversations and, and being courageous, mm. you know, to say, I really want to make the change for this country. I'm not going to hide behind policies and, you know, but I, I really want to make... Um, an impact in this country for the future. Yeah. Uh-uh, don't add. Mm-mm. We are going you want to add. Um, <laughs> as we edge towards the conclusion, then quick answers as well. Okay. Do you think organizational you you make uh, your business out of this? So I want to hear your answer. Do you think organizations should stop teaching people resilience and rather remove the odds that stress people? You know, you know, if you're going to teach me resilience for the bad leadership Mm. then definitely remove that training Mm. but you should be teaching me resilience for the future Mm. um, for the customers that we serve for the changing marketplace for the changing industry and the changing world definitely Mm. but you know what I will not stand is you teaching me resilience 
for bad systems, bad leadership, and a toxic work environment. Mm. You can miss me on that. Sounds amazing. All right. You guys are my social support, ne? You are. And what do you think is the role of these networks, mentorships, friends, and supportive relationships in in helping to, I guess, in the idea of odds beating? Mm. I think they are quite important, um, especially because we have not seen this in a close setting for ourselves when we were building the career. Mm -hmm. Um, But mentorship and coaching, although it's quite important, you always have to make sure that the mentor and the coach that you are seeking out is aligned in things like values, principles, Mm -hmm. belief systems. Uh, Otherwise, the things that you're getting from that relationship may not necessarily serve you as a human being and Mm -hmm. what you need for your own Mm -hmm. life and may sometimes be in contradiction to your own personal beliefs and value systems. So the good thing about those circles is that they either leave it solely professional, Mm -hmm. as in you are getting the advice that you need on a particular problem uh, that is succinct, that is quick, and that they may have exposure to similar problems. Mm -hmm. But also in the social setting is that you are conversing with people who have very similar backgrounds to you, very similar challenges to you. Um, Because even in those coaching relationships, it's very difficult for someone to give you distinct advice on a problem they've not navigated themselves. Mm. Um, So if I come to you, you will have a perspective of a black male in corporate. Mm. But if I'm speaking to Rufilwes, you will have the perspective of a black female mother, wife in corporate. Mm. Therefore, the advice might differ depending on the situation. Mm. So I think both hold very strong um, value in what you're able to do and both really should be something that you seek and um, pursue those relationships but just understand that it needs to play a very specific role in your life otherwise you will have advice that does not meet the needs of the other the social might not meet the needs of the professional and the professional might not meet the needs Mm -hmm. of the future you that you are cultivating that is still true and authentic to yourself Mm -hmm. I saw this clip of Black Coffee he was talking about the fact that he found a therapist but every time he spoke about his life, the therapist would be so overwhelmed by how <laughs> good his life is. So, yeah. so I guess oh, man. that relatability and so on. It's like, yeah. uh, so Plekhoff will be saying things like, I, I, I just took a jet and then we're like, and then the therapist will be like, you, you took what? a jet? You took a jet. You don't have any problems. <laughs> Sorry, right, in nice closing, guys, problems. and maybe you can you can have both a, a passion. This. In closing, I want to close with my personal passion and what even made a career for me in, in speaking, you know, uh, the idea of the, the impact of personal agency mm-hmm. and proactive uh, behaviors. I think research suggests that individuals who proactively then seek those opportunities, take risks and actively manage their own career are more likely to then beat um, these odds. So please comment on this idea of personal agency and the impact, importance of taking your own ownership as you close. You can then hoi anything you want to <laughs> close with. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, personal agency is key. And I think, like I said earlier in our discussion, I think for me, what resonates more is responsibility mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Um, knowing that I am responsible for the outcomes of my own future and creating a meaning life a meaningful life for myself um, really does fuel um, you know that personal um, agency and also urgency mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um, so yeah I, I I do believe that you ought to stand up tall mm-hmm. um, like you know, the healthy chicken. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> in so closing. That, yeah, so that the opportunities um, do reach you. Do reach so, you. yeah, in closing. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I wanted to say, mm-hmm. in closing, mm-hmm. is there anything I, you you wish I, I asked you and then answer it? Hey. Like, speak your mind. Why is it not Why didn't you ask me this? One? Yeah. <laughs> Um, hmm, no, not really. Can't think of any. Okay, I can't think cool. of any. You, okay. You've been a good host. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm a firm believer in odds beating, and mm. I mean all the science and um, the facts that you've presented. I found to be true um, from my own entrepreneurial journey mm. and experience. Um, I resonated um, with that. Mm. Um, yeah, and I think that you know moving forward. Um, 
yeah, we shouldn't, yes, we shouldn't be beating the odds that are, you know, that have nothing to do with the challenges of work mm. or, you know, um, achieving something. I think um, we, we ought to improve the quality of odds, oh, if that makes, if that makes, makes sense. sense. Um, I can't be, you know, I mean, corporate, um, you know, we, you say our customers are, you know, we king and boss, but then your systems don't prioritize that, you know. Mm. These are petty issues that on a daily basis I need to, you know, dance with that and it causes friction in my life mm. unnecessarily. Um, so, yeah, I think just increasing the quality mm. um, of challenges that we deal with in the workspace would be, you know, um, more favorable. Mm. And I think it would uh, contribute to our progress as just a country mm. um, to progress our industries is, you know, the quality, what, what challenges are we mm. solving mm. if we're still dancing with internal politics, mm. red tape and, you know, all of that. It, it really doesn't give energy and room to innovate or be, you know, global leaders in, in anything. So I, you know, my final thought is servant leadership is the key to that, mm. where leaders are not self-serving. Mm. but rather are in those positions to make sure that we reach our fullest potential in the jobs and roles that we hold, mm. you know, um, and remove um, all the friction there is um, um, in us achieving that. Mm. So, yeah, those are my final thoughts, that That's we so need good. different leaders. We need different leaders. We need to graduate from certain odds. They must be. The yeah. odds that we're facing must improve. I mean. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I've been dealing with a, can't delete the printer for seven years. You know, so yeah, I yeah. hear you very well. And Isa? Yeah, I think from my side also to reiterate what Rafilo said was that um the challenges need to be of better quality. Mm. We we can't still be um, struggling with issues of literacy in a country that is 30 years post apartheid, mm. we, we can't be regressing in some of the quality of standards in our education, mm. which is where my entrepreneurial role has shifted me to say we need to bridge the gap in in schooling, in, mm. in teaching and learning um, in order for us to have quality employers and employees. Mm. Um, but also making sure that you know, we remove those barriers, even as a country at a macro level, we remove those barriers to things like entrepreneurship mm -hmm. for young people, particularly where they are able to build lives of their own good quality lives and a good living being entrepreneurs as opposed mm -hmm. to being small town players in the township. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think we, we need to make sure that those those barriers, those odds are not deeply rooted in our industries, mm -hmm. that we are not known for being those people who have those odds against people and make it unnecessarily difficult mm -hmm. for certain people to join in. But we should seek and strive for transformation in these areas. We should mm -hmm. seek and strive for young people to be passionate into entering those spaces and make it as easy for them as possible without removing the, the challenge that comes with the capacity and capability of what they need to produce mm -hmm. at the end. Mm -hmm. But there's no reason why, for example, there is no big corporates in townships mm. they, there's no reason why there's no big manufacturing plants in the township you sure. know so those things i feel like they are a stamping block into what um a majority of the south africans are able to do and achieve because mm. we are there's there's the inherent you know life adversity but i think there are also a lot of um challenges and odds that were put there on purpose mm. to restrict a huge population of this country mm. from entering. And I think the only way that we can get past that is through education, through self-empowerment, self-development, because ultimately, even though the odds are stacked against mm. you, you still have to persevere. You Absolutely. still have to push through. You still have to do what it ha needs to be done in order for you to succeed as a person. You cannot just throw your hands in the air and mm. say, well... You know, the odds are against mm. me. You know, you still have to have that very strong and positive internal dialogue with mm. yourself to say, I want to make it, I will make it, and I have a capability to make mm. it. Um, but yeah, I think those those odds need to graduate. They need to be of better quality. Mm. We, we can't be struggling with the same things 30 years from today, for mm. example. We need better quality, and it's up to us to demand some of those changes in the spaces that we are in. Absolutely. Quick one, how do people find you? How do we work with you? Or do you guys have enough money? You don't need <laughs> anybody. Well, um, 
Yeah, you you can reach me on LinkedIn professionally, yeah, I think. Sure. Um, you can also follow the Twice Blue SA page on LinkedIn. Um, that's where we post most of the work that we are doing. Mm. Um, yeah, and also if you go on our website, there's also a WhatsApp quick chat if you mm. have a need. Um, so yeah. Website is twiceblue.com. Yes, www. <laughs> <laughs> you used to accuse me of spew, don't say the www. <laughs> say http <laughs> forward slash. <laughs> slash. <laughs> and so do you want us to find you somewhere? Uh, mostly on my professional platform that is LinkedIn. LinkedIn. <laughs> if you want to chat, I'll be on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to move away from uh, social media stuff. They do take away a lot of your focus. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm on LinkedIn for those who want to professionally connect. And yeah, I also have my other social media up and some of it is open. Some of it is private. Mm. But yeah, we do a lot of work in the community. So I'm sure they'll probably see my face somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm don't find us on Instagram. Yeah, th- literally. <laughs> it's <laughs> not professional. Yeah, go to LinkedIn. Uh, it's not professional. <laughs> Let's stick to the professional networking <laughs> platform. Sorry, hey, my guests are not interested. Yes, you know when people give you only their LinkedIn that yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's up to date, <laughs> <laughs> and the DMs are open. Go, LinkedIn, Go LinkedIn, LinkedIn. Yes. Oh, okay. so we can okay. connect and we can chat, but not uh, on Instagram, please. No. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much uh, for coming. This was amazing. This was really fruitful, and we can't wait to to have you again um, to to have these conversations because I think they're necessary. And thank you for adding so much value. So to our listeners and our viewers, thanks so much for tuning in. Please remember to hit that subscribe button. I think it's here. Um, I don't know. It's here. Where should I point? It's here. Uh, Hit that subscribe button. It makes a difference for people to find us. Share the episode widely. Until next time, keep exploring the fascinating, fascinating world of organizational behavior and always strive to make your workplace better for all. Because as... We often say, work does not have to suck. (laughs) We are out of here. That is true. Yes! Yes! Yes!